so um yeah so welcome to the last boot camp of week number one uh, there's actually been a several um, uh, some extra concepts that have popped up that we might want to go over so maybe there's going to be more sessions uh, later um, uh, uh, and one of them is like uh, like checking the packages that we have already made in the past that um, that not everyone here is familiar with and but that could be useful for your work I mean because that's why we made them um, um, so okay so today we'll be looking at a book called the elements of data analytics style so let me share that link with you on the zoom chat uh, so this is a book that um, you can um, buy for a minimum price of zero dollars free or um, you can pay for it whatever you want um, so please um, you know buy it uh, or whatever price you think is okay um, uh, or just try it out for free and then later on you can buy it and so this book is also by Jeff Leak um, um, and it's also based on some concepts that he had on his um, uh, on his blog, but also on some of the things that he uh, uh, focused on on his teach on his classes in the PG program and biostatistics. But it was last updated in 2015, so it's a bit um, it's, it's been a while. Um, however, a lot of these ideas still apply, um, and in a sense, Jeff still uses these ideas. So. Uh, if we go to look at his Twitter account, um, um, Jeff is actually currently teaching a course. Um, 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 so he's teaching adva advanced data science. And so in this course, he's actually using some of the material and ideas that are also part of the uh, of the book that he's talking about um, um, right like uh, for example like last week or so he was talking about do as I say not as I do that was thing uh, but um, so you know this is I guess a new set of materials um, uh, advanced data science and so uh, uh, we can look into this also later, uh, but I mean, this is like actively being developed right now by Jeff, um, and so we'll focus more on the book that was previously developed by Jeff that has um, a lot of the same concepts and stuff. So maybe move, maybe moving on towards the future, we'll, we'll use the new book. I mean, new course, uh, but explains a lot of the ideas in this book. So I have already downloaded the book, um, um, and so. It's about a hundred pages long, but like it can be read fairly fast. And so today, I think we'll go over um, most of the ideas for this uh, um, for the book. Um, we won't like you know fully read it or whatever, but um, 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 that's what we'll do today. So the first thing Jeff talks about. And it's actually the first thing he talked in his advanced data science class right now is the part of the data analytic question, right? Um, um, so uh, uh, this is something that is you know, very important in any project where we're gonna be uh, involved ourselves or, um, or helping others. And sometimes people need a lot of help defining that question, right? What is what is it? What they want to answer, um, um, and so it's important that we define the question that we're trying to answer because otherwise you can just get lost, right? There's a bunch of things we can do, um, uh, and uh, and you can like spend a lot of time trying a, a bunch of different methods or tools, 
um, uh, uh, and that might not lead you anywhere really, right? So I was talking with someone, one person here earlier about one of our research projects, and that's basically what we need to do right now. We need to spend a bit more time um, uh, um, thinking about this, the data question, the data questions that we want to try to answer, right? Um, now, once you define the question that you're interested in answering, then you can find the data for it. So, uh, John Tukey is a very famous person in the field of statistics because he's thought a lot about also like visualization. Um, and so there's this quote from him that data may not contain the answer, but then you can use some of the data you have. Um, what is it? The combination of some data and an aching desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. Okay, so this is about like, uh, like you don't want to end up like p-value hacking type of thing, right? Where you have a data set that is not really tailored for the answer, the question that you have in mind, right? Um, okay. Um, <laughs> so there's this nice little diagram over here. Um, 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 and so if you're just looking at all the full data, then that's not really data analysis. You did summarize it. Uh, are you doing a report of the data? If so, then you're talking about a descriptive type of project. Um, um, sorry, without any interpretation. If you're providing interpretation, then um, 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 are you like applying the your, are you thinking of applying your inter interpretation to a new data, right? And if so, then you then we have inferential, predictive, causal, and mechanistic type of projects. Otherwise, you're just doing an exploratory project, right? And so, I think like a lot of, you know, the projects that we're going to be helping people with are at this phase, right? Where it's just about like let's quantify what we're seeing, um, um, and and just visualize it. Um, there's some projects though where we're going to go further than that. And so at that point, we might be trying to figure out, um, uh, like, uh, what does the average effect do? Um, um, and if we're not trying, if we don't really care about the average effect, then we can just try to, um, 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 look at individual samples or more um, individuals if we're talking about humans, let's say, right? And so that could become either an inferential or predictive type of problem. Uh, we don't actually dive much into the causal, causal or mechanistic type of, of, uh, of projects. Um, most of our work ends up being inferential in nature. Um, um, cool. So, uh, I went back, sorry. Um, so, you know, Jeff explains a bit more about the different types of projects and stuff like that. Um, and so I won't get into those details right now. Uh, here, it might be good to take a little peek at his, uh, uh, um, Um, here are defining the question. Um, so here he's saying like the difference between failure and success is having a question really. Um, and so um, Jeff, Roger Peng and other people wrote actually a paper um, on what is the question. Um, uh, and so that could also be a good resource to look at. Um, um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah. 
So this was a, sci a science paper. Um, um, oh, I will need to log in but because we're recording this at once. Um, so I don't get in trouble with science <laughs> about showing <laughs> something that is not, uh, you know, I don't want them suing me or whatever. Okay. Um, so, I mean, Jeff has a, uh, Jeff and Roger have a paper here. What is the question? It's from a while back, so also 2015, so around the same time as this book was last updated. Um, um, and I can see here that they're using a lot of those same ideas um, in, in this new course, um, in this new way of presenting that information. Um, okay, let me go back to the book. Um, so let's say you have a question, right? A lot of times in data analysis, the first thing that you're gonna do then is tidying the data. And we spend a lot of time doing this. Um, and that, um, that involves actually understanding what is the data that we're working with, right? And so um, uh, there's always a raw data and there's a compressed or, or a range format, which is a tidy data set. Um, we should also, we, we saw on the, uh, what they forgot to teach about R, that it's also important to have a cookbook or a, uh, um, a, a file describing what are the variables in our data. Um, and uh, you wanna have the code. Uh, and so here Jeff says like, you wanna have an exact recipe on how you went from the raw data to the tidy data, right? Um, this is really, important and if you're working on a project where you don't know the code for going from the raw data to the tidy data that's a big like red flag and you might want to run away from that project uh, if you can um, uh, because um, if no one knows if it, it, it basically was like an unknown box that uh, was applied between the raw data to the tidy data then there might be some issues in that process that could influence the results of what you're about to do. Um, um, and um, uh, like you won't know about them, right? Um, you won't have any, um, you won't be able to, to, to use that information, that recipe to, to try to debug anything in the future or to understand things. Um, and you might be missing out some very uh, important um, decisions there that are describing that recipe. Um, so in a sense, like a lot of the data we work in is processed from raw data to tidy data uh, or tidier data, right, um, by us, right? So that's why we've, we've been involved in like processing pipelines for like RNA-seq and other type of, types of data um, because we wanna know what happened between the raw data and the, and the more compressed format. Um, and um, we wanna be aware of how those decisions can affect the rest of the analysis. Right. Um, oh. um, I guess raw data can be relative because of where it comes from. Um, tidy data, I mean, we've already seen that it has to have um, like the ultimate tidy data, it has to have uh, one row per observation and then one column per variable that you're looking at. Um, 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 uh, let's skip some of this. Um, 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 okay. And so um, Jeff here also talks like, uh, if there's no script, then you have to be careful. Like it has, like the let's say the method section of a paper has to be really well detailed about what were all the parameters, versions, and things about the software that were used. Um, so that's something um, like, for example, in when we write papers, um, um, I like writing the versions of the, of the packages that we used for analyzing the data for a particular project. Sometimes I, we don't have that information, so then I, I suggest just mentioning the biconductor version um, because that will at least give us some. Uh, um, uh, will give at least give everyone else in the public like, like an idea of what you know versions of packages we use. Um, 
but um, uh, the ideal scenario is to, is to record uh, uh, what package versions we use or what software version we use for everything and to mention that in a paper. Um, and so this is something, you know, again, talking about the, what I forgot to teach about R. If, if, you don't, if you don't record that information as you go, once you're at the end of the project writing the paper, it's like almost impossible to figure that out, right? Um, to go back in time and be like, okay, what were the versions of the things I used, right? That's really hard. So it's better to be organized. And that's also one of the reasons why I like this in session info. So I could report about the specific parameters and versions of what I use later. Okay. Um, we've seen, we've done this ourselves. We've done some of the common mistakes that Jeff here highlights, which is like combining multiple variables into a single column, right? Um, um, and so that can be, you know, um, you don't really gain a lot by compressing the data that way. Uh, so you might want to have it into uh, each of them being its own separate column. So for ex the example he gives here is like sex and age, right? So you want to have a sex column and an age column instead of having a, uh, let's say, female adult versus female um, teen and then male adult, the male teen uh, type of variable, right? Instead of having one variable that combines all of it, you want to have the two of them separate. And that's going to make all the statistical model modeling easier later on. Um, and people won't have to do any um, any further processing of, of your uh, metadata um, to use it. Um, uh, merging unrelated data into a single file, we've seen that uh, in the sense of um, on the, what they forgot to teach you about R. They were talking about not don't make a big R data object that has a bunch of different objects, right? Um, they were talking about it from the perspective of uh, making your code cleaner. Right, and easier to read, but um, uh, this is also a very common mistake of let's just save every single object that we have in our R script into, into a single file, right? Um, uh, we don't do this much uh, now, but like, uh, but I've seen this type of, uh, of, um, of behavior, let's say, um, by uh, in the past, right? So that's like like saving like save everything ls into a file, uh, right? Um, right. You want to be doing that type of thing, right? That's like saving the workspace. Um, um, I. Um, Checking the data here, this is more applicable to, uh, let's say, consultants, right? Um, so uh, if you're giving data by someone else and then they're like, oh, um, uh, can you use that data um, and you know, make an analysis for me or make a report or something, um, this is when people will give you like um, the data and a code book, right? Um, and so, if that's the starting, port, starting point of the project, then uh, you do need to go and check, you know, what was given to you. Um, and so um, for us, uh, this applies a bit more into the exploratory data analysis than specifically checking that the data that was given to us was um, uh, is uh, correctly specified, right? And so, um, this chapter applies more to, let's say, someone that gives you a spreadsheet, right? And then they're saying like, okay, this is a sex column. Let me check that like all the variables in that sex column have like, let's say, um, uh, F for female, M for male, right? Maybe, you know, maybe someone made a typo and then you have a, 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 a minus 99, let's say, right? And then you're like, oh, what does that even mean, right? And so, uh, uh, this is something that is uh, becomes more important if you're working with data uh, from the web and type of things, right? Um, um, and so we generally actually don't do this as much, right? Let's say we're working from data, like rna data from someone else. We'll reprocess the data instead of using their tidy, like um, more compressed data. 
Um, and that's again, because we wanna know exactly what, how the data was transformed from a raw data format to a, a more processed data format. Um, so, um, you know, the particulars of this chapter are useful if, if we're, for some of the scenarios that are not as common to us. Um, um, I don't know about like the imaging side with Maddie. Maybe at that point, like some of this stuff will applies more. Um, but um, uh, 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 but like typically, like like even on an RNA seq example, like um, uh, if someone someone is like, "Hey, can you do this RNA seq uh, analysis?" A lot of times, it's using other tools that we develop for processing the data. So we already know that like the data should have um should be um uh, should well should be well specified right um, um okay um there's something on the chat mm -hmm. okay um cool so this applies to maddie um and so this chapter could be useful for you then to read more Next chapter is about tidying the data. So I just skipped completely. Um, the, uh, sorry, oh, I went back, sorry. Um, uh, exploratory analysis, sorry. So that's the next chapter. So this is something we definitely do. Um, um, and so um, Jeff highlights here that interactive analysis is the best way to explore data. Uh, and that's because uh, the goal of exploratory analysis to, is there's three parts that we want to understand properties of the data. Um, and visually, actually, our brains are quite, uh, you know, our brain is really smart, right, and our eyes and stuff. And we can um, discover patterns of the data that maybe were hidden to us, that if we just look at a set of statistical results and output, we might not actually notice, right? Um, so that's why um, doing this interactively is the best. Um, um, uh, and so <laughs> I didn't know this quote, I guess, but uh, uh, from Robert Gentleman. Robert Gentleman is a um, uh, co-author of R and founder of Biconductor. Um, um, he worked uh, in academia and then in industry. He worked at Genentech and then 23andMe. And recently, this summer, went back to academia. Uh, uh, but yeah, I guess he says here, like, make the big data as small as possible, as quickly as possible, right? So this is this is funny because like um, people are like, oh, like, um, do you work with like small data or big data? Right? Everyone wants to say wants to say that they work with big data, right? And in a, in a, you know, in some sense, we do, right? Like uh, RNA seq projects and all of that, like. The fast Q files can take several you know, hundreds of gigabytes, or even it can be as big as a couple of terabytes uh, for some of our projects. Um, and so that's pretty big, right? You need quite a bit of this to store that. It's bigger than our laptop, right? Uh, but then we make the data small, small enough, and like at some point, the like a, a table of gene expression measurements that's small enough that we can use it in our computer, right? In our own laptop. Um, um, so that's um, an apply to this. Um, cool. So um, uh, we saw this on the R Club on Friday, but one of the keys is to plot as much data as you can, right? We saw this in the in the R Club because we're looking at box plots, just like this one, and like a box plot like this is just hiding a lot of what's going on, right? Uh, it can be useful sometimes, but it, it's also hiding a lot of the properties of the data. Like in this case, it looks like both of them are similar X and Y, right? They have a similar median. Y is a bit more uh, uh, less variable because the box is smaller, um, but they have around a, a, a similar median and about a similar interquartile uh, inter range. Uh. Salute. I saw someone sneeze. <laughs> um, and so uh, this, you'll notice this is actually a type of plot that Andrew loved to make, right? And um, we, we've, even, we've done this type of plot so much with base plotting 
that like we have the code in like a bunch of different projects where it's like, okay, we're going to use base R and we're going to add all the points of it and we're going to add them with a little scatter, a random scatter around the X axis um, center for that column, for that box plot. And so we'll add all the points here, right? Um, and so this stage, right, this plot, for example, reveals that the Y variable has actually two groups of data, um, while the X one is more like a bell-shaped type of variable. Right? If, if we did a density plot for the, for the data on the X shape, on the X variable, we would get a, a, a bell. If we did it for Y, we would get two bells, right? So they're, they're actually quite different. Um, um, uh, now, uh, a lot of times there's no benefit to spending a, uh, um, to making your plots pretty. Uh, and so, um, uh, there's this concept of like, let's try to make your exploratory graphs, uh, quickly, right? Cause they're for yourself. Um, now this is something where it gets a little bit tricky, right? Because, um, if, if this is export, if, if we're making an exploratory plot that is going to be part of a paper, right? Then even if it's a supplementary figure, then we will want to make it pretty uh, or pretty enough, right? And so um, uh, this is actually sometimes easier to do with like ggplot2, right? Where we can have um, uh, some options like uh, that uh, make our little graph a little bit prettier. Um, and so we could always use, for example, increase the point size um, from the default and make all the text bigger. Um, and that's just a small change, uh, but it's something that can help us uh, later on. So let me just run an example of that. Um, um, what I'm talking about, so you can see it in action. Um, right, so let's say, you know, this is a default plot, um, and that might be good enough for what we're doing, but just a little bit. of extra code uh, can make our plot nicer, right? So I just added the theme underscore BW command uh, and I set the base size to 20. And so that increased the point size of the plot. Um, and so it's not, you know, that much different from the previous plot, but it's um, the, the um, the text is a lot bigger, um, and so that's a nicer, that's a nice property we want to have for uh, supplementary plots um, and uh, uh, on papers and stuff. So, uh, if you have the code made like this, right, going back and updating your plot, your PDF later on uh, at the time that you're writing the paper can be a lot of work. So again, this is one of those things like kind of like the organization for like doing it from the beginning uh, will save you a lot of pain in the end. Um, and it's still a quick plot, but just a tiny bit, you know, modified and, um, and, um, <clears throat> and improved. Um, um, like uh, if you want to go and be really fancy, you could even save that object. P, this plot object as its own R data file. And then like later, like, you know, let's say I make this like uh, uh, Elio. Um, oh, wait. Uh, right. I'm saving it into an object. So I could always like uh, 
sorry, I could always like save that object. Um, by itself, right? I actually haven't done this. I've thought about it uh, for some projects, but like if I just save the, the plot um, object um, and later on it's like, oh, can you just, you know, make the points bigger? Can you just, uh, can you make, uh, let's say we don't like the small grid lines and we want to remove them, right? Uh, or can you, you know, do this little thing or that thing, right? Then I already have an, an easy R object that I can load and modify. And, and end up with a new PDF, right? Um, 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 a lot of times I don't do this because I'm making a ton of plots, right? And it would be quite a bit of work. And I'm, maybe I just need to have a little like helper function for doing this, right? Uh, but it's, it, it's pretty, I think it could be pretty um, useful um, moving on. Um, then um, Jeff highlights the uh, plots are better than summaries. And so this is an example um, that you might have seen uh, already in, in some of your classes before and stuff. But it's, um, uh, this is an example where you have an X and a Y variable and we have four different, very different shapes, but all of them end up having a very similar correlation coefficient between the two of them. And so, if you, just, if you simply just print the statistical output of like, okay, what is the correlation between X and Y? And let's say I say it's like 0.7 or something. Um, maybe people will be expecting something like this top left scenario where we have uh, points that are basically on the diagonal line, but maybe the behavior of our data is like this um, parabola over here or something weird where it's like all in a line except one of them that's outside of the line or like most of it is not related and then we have a big like outlier, right? That, that influences the, the statistical output. Um, so we do this all the time and like, um, um, like Rafael Rizari, he would even, um, uh, he suggests sometimes making a, a PDF with like let's say a thousand of plus, right? Like maybe we're looking at how the expression of a gene is, um, uh, uh, it's looking in between cases and controls, right? And so maybe he, you know, plots that a thousand times and then that way he can get a, he can look through a PDF really quickly, right? Like something like this, right? Like, um, and then just get an idea of like, how does the, um, uh, how is that covariate affecting the, the expression of, uh, or um, the outcome of interest that he's looking at, right? And then he can get an idea of like what is this, what would be the correct statistical distribution to use for that data, right? Um, or what are some of the statistical properties that might be at play? So just making a bunch of plots. Um, this kind of like commits, right? I get commit or or uh, uh, is cheap. I, I'm making a ton of plots is cheap. Uh, you should just make you know a ton of them in the exploratory data analysis. Organizing all those plots and all of that can be a lot of work, right? But that's why we also focus a little bit, yes, and the, the past two days on the project-oriented workflows and how you can try to organize your code a bit better. Right? Um, something that I don't do as much, but it's a good point, is that sometimes when you have a lot of data, you um, it might be best to um, to subsample the data. Um, because if you have a lot of data, you might be over plotting um, and you might be losing something, um, some information about how the two variables are related to each other. Instead of subsampling, I like to use um, uh, um, alpha blending color uh, uh, on the colors. Um, 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 but uh, you can't lead to very big plots that can take a while to load and stuff. You have a lot of data. Um, so uh, we have more information than just that. We have you know, color and size, so we can all use that information too for checking some of these covariates. Um, uh, we can use um, uh, paneling, right? So faceting in, in the terms of ggplot2. Um, and if you have a lot of plots, then you might want to make sure that the axis is 
similar between your plots. Um, um, if you have data that's far spread out, you might want to load transform it um, uh, and things like that. So um, one other type of plot that can be quite useful is this uh, bland Altman plot, uh, which in, 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 um, in uh, the world of RNA-seq is mostly known as a MA plot, um, capital M, capital A plot. Uh, but this type of plot ha is when you have an X and a Y variable, and instead of plotting X versus Y, what you plot is X plus Y versus X minus Y. Um, so uh, it's almost like you're rotating the data a little bit. Um, and so at that point, you get uh, you can get the mean of x plus y on the y-axis. Um, um, wait, did I say that? No, sorry. Um, x plus y on the on the x-axis, and then the difference between them on the y-axis. Right. Um, so this type of plot is, can become quite useful for. Um, seen as smaller differences than, uh, um, 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 seeing these what they call here magnitude effects. Um, um, uh, and so this is particularly useful for expression because some of our genes are highly expressed, some of them are not as expressed. And so if we didn't do this, uh, the end result could be, wait, uh, I thought Jeff had a plot about that. Maybe, let me see if I can find it. Um, um, oh yeah, I just saw it. Otherwise you end up with something like this. Um, uh, so, here, the X and the Y variable um, have a quite a big uh, quite a big range, but like we have a lot of points that have very low X and Y coordinates, right? And so we just plot X versus Y. Uh, it looks like everything is really similar, but uh, a, a bland Altman plot um, or an MA plot uh, is actually a lot more useful than that here. Um, um, so we'll, we use this quite a bit in, in our work in genomics. Uh, so let me see if I can find where we were quickly. Cool. All right. Um, so that's a common tick, uh, tip. Um, uh, uh, so this, I guess, is where the balance comes between like how much work you want to do now versus how much work you want to do later. Uh, when you have your write in the paper, uh, optimizing styles, he says here can be can be uh, it might be a mistake. However, I found it. Uh, um, uh, I emphasize that like uh, some some defaults that you can change early on will make your plot uh, much more likely to to be good enough for your supplementary figures on a paper. Um, so spending a bit of time having uh, that the default set can be useful early on because um, you don't want to go back in time and have to reload all those long scripts and remake those plots. Um, um, cool. Um, one of the uh, big mistakes is actually failing to explore data. Um, so if you don't explore the data and you're like, hey, like, just, just apply the model and then let's get the results. That's all we need, right? Uh, we have collaborators that are like that, right? That they just want to have the results. Um, and then it's like, no, no, no. Exploring the data is really important. We need to make sure that, you know, uh, uh, that the data is uh, uh, behaving like we thought it would uh, and to check if there's anything funny. Um, and if there's something funny, then maybe we need to adjust for it or try to correct for it, type of thing. Uh, in our type of work, we don't have a lot of missing values. 
but like there might be patterns of missing values that we are not looking at. Um, um, uh, uh, and in that, in that case, like, you know, in that type of problem, looking at the, um, the distribution of when the data is missing can be really important. All right. So mm, let me pause the recording. Cool. All right. So um, we just finished the exploratory analysis chapter. And so the next two chapters are um, much more statistics focused. Um, uh, I mean, and statistics is an important component of data analysis. Um, now, um, I'm tempted to skip to them because, uh, uh, like, here Jeff is just giving us a little bit of a taste of, of statistics. And, um, and it's important to know the concepts, concepts that he's talking about in, this, in the next two chapters. However, like, um, um, I think at this point it's best for you guys to, to read them a bit more um, carefully, what he's saying here. And it potentially uh, deserves reading a more, um, a more um, advanced uh, book, let's say. Um, um, uh, um, um, uh, and like all of us understand that like statistics is an important component of, of working with data. And now uh, the specific statistics that we need to know for a given project are gonna vary a lot. Um, uh, now let's say, you know, you're interested in machine learning and stuff like, is uh, Jeff explained some of the core concepts about it on his chapter seven. Um, uh, so I'm gonna jump to the chapter on gradient analysis uh, because um, that's part of, I, I would say maybe the, the soft skills, right? Uh, of the non like, um, um, you know, some skills that we need to have that maybe we don't practice them as much and um, and I know from some of you, several of you, that there's interest in, in, uh, in you know, getting better at, 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 at writing and communicating. And so Jeff has some good ideas on this chapter about, uh, he's, he's thinking about like writing analysis, right? So this would be like um, uh, maybe a paper in, in what, that's way what he has in mind at this point. But um, you could also like just, take the word analysis out and like write it by, replace it by like writing blogs, for example. Um, um, and a lot of the concepts in this chapter are gonna to apply to that. Because anything that you write should communicate a message clearly and in a way that is readable to non-technical audiences, right? Um, and so that's the real challenge of writing a paper or writing a blog post. Um, and that's something that is like, you know, I'm not gonna say I'm the best paper writer because I'm not, right? Um, uh, but this is something that I've practiced myself through my blog over the years. Um, and um, I, something that I always struggle is like, I wanna tell like everything that's related to the story. And uh, Jeff says that the goal should be to tell a, a clear, precise and compelling story. And, I sometimes just want to tell you everything that went involved in it instead of just focusing on the very uh, smaller, clear message, right? Um, and so uh, there are some drawbacks with me explaining everything, and that is like you lose your audience if you have a longer blog post or a longer paper. Um, um, and on the if you're writing a paper, um, if you confuse your reviewers, then they might lose sight of what were the main findings of the research um, uh, that you performed. And if they get confused, then they might not understand what you're talking about, and then they might then be really negative on the reviews towards you, right? Um, and so a paper is a lot more challenged, I would say, challenging than a blog post because it has a ton of information that you're trying to transmit, right? Um, uh, 
And so papers can seem really daunting. And, um, and I think like, just like with a lot of the things we're, we're, we've been talking about, practice is your ally, right? That's how you can get better. Um, and so having said all of that, like some of the elements, let's say of, of a paper or even a blog post or, or let's say an art markdown file that you've made is you wanna have like a good title you want to actually introduce and motivate the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Um, um, and so I've seen some art markdowns um, um, that we've made as a team, right? Where sometimes it's just, it's just really like an art script, right? There's only like code and, and comments and there's not really any introduction of like, what is this art markdown file describing, right? Like, what is this step doing? Um, and then what are some of the assumptions of how we're doing things, right? And so talking about statistics and stuff, like uh, like you might want to actually explain some of the uh, methods that you're using. Um, and then like mention some of the problems that might happen and cite other people, right? Um, so um, uh, I use this syntax on my blog posts. So for example, let me just show you, uh, um, my template for blogs. Um, so this is this is a file that I use as my template for blog posts, and I already have the code for including like references and reproducibility, right? Um, so um, so even for a blog post, I try to be, you know, to give credit to everyone um, that influenced whatever I'm writing. And so there's a, you know, um, a specific template for the, the, the technology that I'm using for writing blog posts. And I think um, uh, uh, it's useful to have a template like, like this for, um, um, for whatever, um, uh, blog post or vignette or paper you want to write, right? You always want to think about like, what are all the components of it? Can I post the link? Sure. Let me post the link. Um, chat, chat, chat. Mm -hmm. I actually have a blog post about creating templates for your blogs. <laughs> so a bit of a inception thing there. All right. um, cool. So you wanna, Jeff tells us that we wanna leave with a question that you're answering, right? And so even on a presentation, on an art model, all of that, you wanna explain at the early on, what is it that you're trying to solve, right? Because, uh, uh, People will read that and they'll be like, oh, okay, this is an interesting question. I want to learn about how they answer that question, right? If you just jump into the, solu the solution, they'll be like, okay, this is a bunch of code. I have no idea where this came out of, right? Or, or a bunch of data or a bunch of plots. Like, what, you know, what am I even looking at? Right? Um, if we're talking about like a more uh, complex uh, process, you want to actually describe like, what is the data? Uh, Right? Like if we're talking about a paper, we want to describe what is the data, how it was these, how was the data obtained. Um, uh, um, so this could even be like, let's say you're uh, scraping some data from the web. You describe how you chose to, which are the websites you chose to, you chose to uh, scrape, uh, uh, scrape from, right? That'll access data from, um, and how do you, you know, uh, design that that um that component of your study or, or of your exploration right then you can describe the data itself um so that could be a little bit a little bit of a um of the exploratory data work that you did in the past um, um and so something that jeff really uh, um emphasizes on is like if you're talking about like complex statistics and stuff like that instead of using like like the specific equations, right, the, um, of the math with all the covariates and all of that. Sometimes just using like um, uh, 
math-like equations, right? Where here we have W equals A plus B times H plus E, right? Something like that can be a lot more human readable and understandable by a more broader audience than the audience that knows the specifics of the math, right? Uh, of what you're uh, showing, even if even if this is not like completely precise, right? Um, it might be better. Um, um, you can always explain the full equation in like a supplementary section. Um, um, okay. Um, so then there's a couple like statistical concerns here uh, that uh, I'm gonna skip because they're really specific to whether you're um, you have a model that um, that is the center of your story versus just writing in general. Um, um, this is something I really struggle on, which is do not report every analysis you perform, right? So if I'm telling a story in a blog post, sometimes I want to tell every angle of the story of, uh, or every player that was involved or something um, um, or everything that influenced me, right? And so at that point, I might lose people. Um, so this is something you want to be careful about. Um, uh, um then we are working with like um with methods developed by other people that um uh the only way that they can get recognition is by people uh, mentioning their work and so it's really important to reference include references um don't assume that people know what lima is for example right like Lima is a very popular bioconductor package, but uh, you might say like, oh, I just use I use Lima, right? And then they could be like, okay, cool, that's uh, you know, five letters. Um, you know, maybe you made maybe you made a typo and you meant to say Lima, right? Like like a mathematical Lima, right? Uh, uh, and so referencing uh, uh, software methods is really important, even on a blog post. Oh, yeah. The next chapter is about creating figures. So this comes back to the exploratory data analysis. Um, um, uh, all right. <clears throat> and so oh, there's the pie charts. There's always a discussion about pie charts. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> uh, what is the problem with pie charts? Uh, one of the problems is that it's very hard visually to tell apart the difference uh, between let's say A and B here. Um, to my eye, it looks like A is a little bit bigger than B, but how much bigger I can't really tell, right? Um, and so a bar plot actually will make that difference much more obvious, right? And if we're, we're trying to highlight the differences between things, then, uh, then a, type of, a bar plot in this case is a lot more precise. Um, if you just wanna highlight that everything is about the same, then maybe a, a pie chart is okay, right? Um, but if we wanna highlight the differences, then a bar chart will be better. And that's because now everything is on a common scale and you'll notice here that the x-axis is starting at zero. And that's because like, um, actually a couple of years ago, Jeff noticed that uh, um, a news outlet was um, showing data that <laughs> did not have the exact, exact the y-axis starting at zero. And so the, like if you just start the y-axis, let, let's say at um, 16 or something, then visually, is gonna look like there's a huge difference between orange and green, right? Between A and B. Um, but that's just a an, an, an visual artifact that you introduce by uh, changing the Y axis origin. Um, ggplot2 facets and all of that can be really useful. Like the, the function uh, ggpairs from the ggally package, for example produce a ton of useful information. The problem is you end up with a figure that has a ton of information on it. And so um, if you have a ton of information, 
then it's hard for your viewers to know where they should focus on. Um, so, <clears throat> um, there's, you know, there's, um, um, it might be good for your exploratory data analysis to have a plot with all the information like that. But for your story that you're presenting, you might have to make a different plot where you just focus on the specific thing you want to highlight. Um, so I like like ggAlly um, with G, with the function gpairs or like um, uh, facets and all of that. I love making those when I'm exploring data. But when you're actually trying to present a, a final story, sometimes they're not as useful. Um, and so you might have to just focus on a small part, part of it. Um, 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 <laughs> I guess uh, 3D plots are not welcome, <laughs> basically. Um, um, color and size, you know, we've, we've already, we use it a lot. Um, and that's, we try to communicate things like that. With colors, uh, we try to use facets too. Uh, when we're looking at complex data. Um, um, so we use all of those, but sometimes too many colors, too many, too much size and faceting can just make your plot really busy. Uh, so sometimes you might just want to highlight a specific portion of it and then have more plots as supplementary. Um, access should be large, easy to read, and in plain language. And that's where like the theme um, uh, on the score uh, a BW example that I showed, uh, I think it was here. Yeah, this theme underscore BW base size equals 20, right? That's just like, uh, I'm just making the text a lot bigger, easier to read. Um, um, and, um, and I'm just making it by default on a lot of the plots. Um, the Access labels, though, sometimes I don't always write them in plain language, especially if, like, if I'm exploring data. I might not take the trouble of, of explaining them in plain language. Um, but if I'm presenting the story or the paper or blog post, at that point, it does pay off to explain things in plain language on the, on the Y and X axis labels. Um, sometimes what I even do is like I'll edit the, act, the X or Y axis label on Illustrator, for example, if the plot took a lot of time to make. Um, uh, and I'm just you know, editing for a paper at, at that point. Um, you want to include the units. Um, um, and you want to use figure legends. We want to use figure legends because we saw in the chapter about modern scientists that um, if you're reading a paper, uh, you're most likely just gonna jump into the figures. Um, you're more likely to, to, re, to check the figures than to read the rest of the paper, right? Because you remember there was this big breakdown that Jeff had of like 100% of the time he reads the title, like uh, I think it was like 50% of the time he reads the abstract and then like 10% or so he reads the figures and then one to 3% of the time he reads the rest, right? Something like that, I don't, I mean, um, um, the exact percents are uh, probably not the ones I said, but that's, uh, that's part of what he said on his book of modern scientists. Um, so you wanna use figure legends. Um, 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 the titles should also communicate the message of the plot. So this is like, um, uh, 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 I wanted to show an example, but it's also not. Uh, it's a paywall paper of ours. Um, um, oh, actually, I can read it. Cool. Uh, so, this is an example here where, like, um, uh, the title of the plot, right? Uh, it's just like saying like, okay, what is the message of this figure? We're looking at differences in, across development between two brain regions. 
that's all that this you know, figure is trying to highlight. The actual caption, though, explains all the details that if this is the only part of the paper that you're reading, uh, it's going to give you a bit more information and context, right? So it's explaining, it's defining all the acronyms that show up in, the, well, or most of them. Gil PSC and hippocampus are very common acronyms in this paper in particular. Um, but like some of the other acronyms are, are defined in the figure caption. Um, 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 uh, so this is like an example, an applied example of, of um, trying to have figure titles that communicate everything plus the, the, that communicate the message plus the figure caption showing the details of what the plot is uh, telling you. Um, sometimes Jeff actually adds text to the actual plot, right? So he might, this is very useful if you're actually giving a presentation um like a talk right um uh uh so actually having text inside of the of the figures and saying like oh like i want you to notice that these orange points are outliers right um uh so he might add a little bit of the text there doing this with like base r or, or, or g plot can be a little bit of pain um uh, but this is something you can easily do let's say like using google slides or Illust uh, illustrator or powerpoint or any of the tools for making presentations. Um, so it depends on, or if you're making a blog post, it might be worth like editing and adding like a little bit of what you want to highlight uh, with text inside of the plot. Um, there are some R packages for like adding like text to to a ggplot2, for example, plot, or we can just use ggplot2 code for it, but um, it becomes a bit painful sometimes to use those. Um, uh, and maybe there are some packages out there that I'm not super familiar with that could make it a bit, uh, I, I could make this stuff more uh, easy to do, especially adding the arrow. Adding the arrow, I think, could be a little bit harder than adding the text. Um, um, all right. Um, again, the figure captions should be like kind of self-contained, so that's where I'm trying to define the acronym. Um, like on the paper, I believe that I define the acronym FQN, but then I also define the acronym FQN inside of the figure caption. So I define it twice inside of the text for people who are reading the full um, paper, but inside the figure because maybe this is the only part where they're looking at that. Um, uh, and so if they just see like FQN here on this plot, they might be like, I have no idea what that actually stands for, right? Um, um, so that's part of the process of explaining things. Um, cool. Some common errors. Um, you might be using some colors that colorblind people can't see. And there's actually multiple uh, variants of colorblindness or, um, or um, uh, what's the correct term? Uh, um, Visually impaired people, um, um, visually impaired. Um, so there's diff different types of visual impairment. Uh, uh, impairedness, is that the word? I don't know, okay. Um, um, and so some of the defaults in R, ggplot2, they're like maybe not the best, some of them are okay. Um, and, um, um, like, for example, if you're trying to show like a, a gradient, you might actually want to use the Veritas uh, palette. Uh, that's a palette that we used a lot on the spatial LIVD paper um, package. So um, let me just load this shiny app. Might take a little bit to load. Um, uh, um, let me just load. Um, that is right. So this colored palette that goes from yellow to blue is actually with greens in the middle. Is a, um, uh, a a palette that was designed to be um, visible by like a lot of people, right? Um, 
so this type of palette and functions and stuff. Um, there's actually a small package called Veritas that defines this palette. Um, uh, which I'll show the link. Uh, I didn't want to go there. This is where I want to go. Um, so let me add it to the chat. Um, it's a very small package and it uh, defines um, uh, the Veritas palette, uh, which is um, easy to uh, visualize. Um, cool. Um, but I think there's, uh, as a whole, the art community maybe needs to improve and um, uh, or do a bit more work in trying to make sure that some of the default colors that we're using are um, uh, visible by other by everyone. Um, um, okay. Uh, a problem is like using colors colors that are very similar to each other, and so there's actually there's a lot of scientific papers actually about how to choose colors um, to make sure that they're uh, they look different enough from each other. Um, a lot of people, a lot of times people don't actually visualize the data using scatter plots, um, or they don't, um, uh, use logarithms to try to, um, uh, reduce, uh, how variable the data is, right? Um, and so that was, we saw this example already about like, it might be best to use a bland Alman plot, um, or, uh, an Amy plot if we're talking about seek uh, than just x versus y um, um, you're making a lot of plots maybe some of the panels don't have the same scale and so that might be misleading sometimes um, uh, <laughs> bar plus with antennas oh that's funny or dynamite plots uh, I didn't know they had a name like that uh, but like, uh, just look, look at the website, find my plots. Um, um, hmm. <laughs> I guess this, these bar plots that have the, the spread around them are not as useful as just having the, the center plus the spread. Um, well, I didn't know they were called, they were called dynamite plots. Cool. Um, one payful one uh, is being consistent about colors. So, um, I mean, the, the error then is being inconsistent about it. Um, and so, uh, this is something that, uh, that if you're then telling a story, right? If on fear one, let's say, uh, let me go back to my paper. Um, um, like if on, let's say on panel A, the LPC is orange, hippocampus is blue, but then on panel C is reversed, that would be incredibly confusing for everyone, right? Um, and so uh, this is, you know, a project that took a, quite a bit of time. So, uh, and actually, um, the initial version of panel A in this case was made by someone else. So I had to make sure that we were using the same colors um, for everything. Um, and so this kind of, this is a painful wall to pay, like it takes a lot of effort um, um, uh, to make sure that you're using the same colors. And so um, it might even make sense on the code organization side to just have a, a, main, a main script that defines the colors. Um, so let's say <clears throat> it could be a very simple script. Let's say that uh, um, uh, that's just like uh, uh, let's call it. Let's for example just call this MVVC colors, right? Just giving a, uh, an example that could be like actually applied, right? So we could be like MVV is um, blue. 
um, and then control is equal. Uh, here I'm going to use one of the fancy colors. Let's let's use uh, light blue. Uh, well, no, I don't want to use too blue. Sorry. Um, let's use tomato tomato four. Right? I think that's one of the our colors. Um, and so I could save this script as like uh, let's say like uh, zero zero one uh, main colors that are right, um, and then like on some other script then um, I can then be like source zero zero one main colors that are right. Um, so that type of organization might make it easier to be consistent about how you're using colors across all the plots and stuff, right? Um, um, so this is just an example, right? Um, you might not actually want to implement it this way. You might actually have to do it like MDV, um, uh, like actually some of the scenarios might be like, you maybe might want to use like a palette, for example. And at that point, this might be a function, right? Um, so for example, uh, um, Let's call this function n, and our function will be our color brewer um, is equal n. But then we set a palette. Let's say like uh, set one, for example, right? Um, so then, uh, if I source it right, maybe later on it could be like, oh, I need like. Uh, I need like three colors, right? Um, I thought it was my desktop, but I'm not. We just say this as um, zero zero two. Um, did I make a mistake? Sorry, not pal, his name. Right, so yeah, now in my second script, right, I can load it and maybe now I, I can be like, okay, I need three colors here. Maybe in another one I use, I need like uh, um, uh, five colors, right? Um, so I'm already like choosing a specific palette or something, right? Um, so colors can be, you know, can be a bit of a problem, but um, um, uh, but that could be one way of doing it. Um, if you're actually really careful, you'll notice that this orange and this orange are actually not the same ones. We use the slightly different ones, um, 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 and because we didn't we didn't have a specific file like that that was super precise, but color that we were using in both, right? Um, um, so you could be, you know, you could, you could be more precise on what I'm doing. Um, okay. So uh, we saw on the, uh, on the Modern Sciences book that there was a chapter about like um, giving talks. And so that a lot of that advice actually overlaps with this presenting data chapter. Um, and so, for example, Jeff is like, okay, why do you actually want to give a talk, right? Um, so maybe you want to meet people, 
You want to get people excited about what you think, or you want to maybe help people understand what you're thinking about, right? Um, and, and overall, you want people to get to know you, right? You want to, to, to have people recognize you in the future. Um, and so, uh, uh, in several of the career planning sessions we had, I've had so far with some of you, like uh, this topic has come up, right? About presenting, um, presenting either your data, but or like uh, or your or your ideas, right? And so, um, I think it'll be worth checking in more detail this chapter, right? Um, and like reading more carefully what he's talking about here um, and in the modern scientist book. Um, so the, he goes over the different types of talks. Um, and, uh, uh, um, but like something that is always important is like, what are, you, what are you talking about, right? So this is the same thing as, um, as an art markdown file where the very first thing you want to explain is like, what is the problem you're going to try to solve, right? So um, let's say that, like, let's say that uh, I'm running into a problem with some code, right? So uh, in our lab meeting, when like, uh, when I want to ask for help uh, about that problem, like, um, given a very uh, uh, brief overview of what I'm going to try to, what I'm working on, will be useful for everyone else to try to follow me, right? If I just directly jump in into the problem or directly jump in into showing data and we're talking about a paper or directly jump in into some slides showing like, um, uh, for example, some slides on like, um, uh, like to just give a more specific example, like, uh, like slides on like uh, some problems that we have with some brain swaps, right? Uh, without giving a bit more detail of like, um, um, what I'm trying to solve and how I'm trying to solve it, we can lose people, right? And so this is something that all of us need to practice more, right? And so I think like the, uh, the, the presentations that we're gonna rotate through every week, I think will help us get better at this as a team overall. Um, and so this is something we always wanna try to do, to like lead with a, a brief uh, overview of what we're talking about. Uh, you know, again, large fonts come into play. So we already have uh, a, a plot saved with a large font. You don't have to make it before your plot. Like, this is also something that happens a lot, right? Like, just before a plot, like, um, I mean, this happened to me with Andrew. He would be like, hey, Leo, can you just remake this plot and make it, <laughs> make it bigger, <laughs> right? And then it's like, oh, yeah, sure, right? <laughs> but then I have to go into the code and, like, edit it and stuff like that. So if you already saved it with like a big font from the get go, uh, then you're saving yourself some trouble down the line. Um, then you want people to find how can they can get in touch with you, right? And so this is also relevant to the career planning question of what you want people to notice about you, right? So um, if you want them to notice your LinkedIn profile. Maybe you say like, oh, my contact information is like, here's my LinkedIn profile link, right? And then that's the main thing I want you to notice, right? Um, like, uh, like for example, the, the slides that I, sh uh, um, for me, right? Like the slides from the other day, right? Like. I'm, I'm putting my website, right? That's the main thing I want people to, to notice about me, um, right? And on the website, then there's information about how to actually contact me. But this is like the best version I have of presenting myself to the public, right? Um, and so that's why I'm highlighting this particular uh, website. Um, uh, and, uh, and I use that and Twitter in my talks, right? I like to highlight um, my website and then my Twitter. And like, if you go to my Twitter profile, like I actually have a pinned tweet, which highlights something I want people to notice about me, right? So this is a particular, in this case, this is a preprint from earlier this year um, that has a very nice figure that um, uh, Brianna um, Barry made for us. Um, 
uh, and it has like a bunch of links to learn more about me, right? So someone that doesn't know me, right, before they jump into the old other tweets that I highlighted and stuff, they, they see that uh, this is, you know, they get a pretty good idea of who I am just from this um, uh, landing page. Um, and it takes time to develop all that stuff, right? Um, cool. Be sure to attribute this in general, again, like referencing people. You want to reference where you got your plots from, where you got, a, like even a GIF, you, you're going to, or GIF, or however you pronounce it, you want to include a reference for it on your slides. Um, cool. Um, Actually, on the on the topic of credit and stuff, I like including. Uh, let me open another set of slides. Uh, uh, I like the idea of including pictures of people with their names. So, this is actually a slide that has several of you there with your names there. All right, um, and actually later on, I actually included the full names. So if people really wanted to um, uh, to find more about who were the people involved in this particular work or ideas, they can find them, right? And so someone that sees this slide later, they might want to you know, just Google that, you know, the full name, right? Um, and hopefully something pops up. Some of you, some people have names that are hard to Google them. Uh, um, 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 Right, so um, yeah, so I, I like the idea of including full names because I've seen presentations for people that include the pictures and the first name of someone and like I could never find that person even if I really tried, right? Right, it's like, okay, like I have the first name, maybe I can like use the institution of whoever this place, whoever is presenting and try and find them that way, but like, I don't know. There could be a bunch of people and like, <laughs> um, and maybe the picture that they have is old, right? Like maybe I don't even find a little picture from them online. Like it's just, you know, it's just really hard. Um, some of actually on a fancier um, set of slides that we made, let me find you that. Um, um, spatial. Um, This is just another example. On a fancier set of slides here, uh, I included the names, the full names, and the Twitter profiles of everyone. Uh, this was a webinar that had like 600 live uh, people watching it, uh, plus I don't know how many that watched it later on the recording, right? Um, so just the idea of giving credit, right? Uh, so credit like every image, credit every you know, person on the team, etc. cetera. Um, uh, that's why like on the, um, on the Google spreadsheet about information from people in the lab, there's a column about Twitter profiles because um, that way like I can, I know you're, everyone has different Twitter profile names, right? Like how they actually spell it. So that way I can uh, uh, just copy paste that into presentations type of thing, right? Um, Cool. Uh, um, if you're presenting, you want to explain every fear in detail. So how, what does that actually translate to? So you want to explain all the axes, right? So you want to explain, so this is, you know, the idea of this plot is X, right? So that's basically what the title of the plot was, right? Then you want to explain like on the Y axis, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, um, I don't know, for example, sensitivity, the, the x-axis I'm looking at one minus specificity or something. Um, um, just an, as an example, you want to define the axis, you want to define what the plot is showing you. Uh, and then you might want to highlight what is the thing you want people to really notice about that plot. So if you're explaining, let's say, a, a figure someone else made on a journal club, right? That's what you want to show, right? Um, and that's going to help everyone else like understand like what are we supposed to be seeing here? Um, um, 
Uh, and like you, you're writing a, a paper, you, you will want to do that too. If you're writing an art markdown and you're generating some plots, you'll also want to explain in text, not only in code, what are, what are, you, know, what are you visualizing. Um, and so this, you know, takes work, takes time. You need to write more stuff. You need to write text that uh, if you code changes, you need to change that text too, right? In your R markdown type of thing. Um, um, uh, 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 and so um, something that I actually included like on the data science guidance um, website was saying I don't know and like this is also you know this applies to talks too right you have to be willing to say I don't know uh, because sometimes people will try to um, like especially if they're giving a like, job talk people will try to impress others right and like even if, if they don't know the answer maybe they're gonna try to come up with something with something on the fly and that is that is a, a that can lead to a big mistake right where you come up with something on the fly that is incorrect and people in the audience know that you just came up with something on the fly and uh, that, um, uh, that is wrong, right? Um, instead, you can say like, I don't know, but I think this is the solution. That's a much better answer, right? Because then you're make, making it explicit that you don't know the answer, but you think that this could be the answer, right? Um, and then, um, then it's, uh, 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 people will be much more understanding at that point if, you, if, you, if what you thought is, is not right, right? Uh, otherwise, it, 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 you give the impression that you're trying to um, 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 well, I guess, I mean, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, bullshitting people, right? Uh, so, and that's pretty bad. Uh, Oh, this one is really hard sometimes. Like, uh, you might have someone in your audience is asking you nasty questions, and it's a trap. Don't fall for that trap. Don't 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 get aggressive with them too. Um, 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 so, you know, you might you might run into this. Hopefully, you won't, but it might happen. Um, um, the last one is finish on time. I try to respect people's time. Uh, and uh, you share your talk, I guess. Um, cool. So that is the end of creating figures. We've talked about representability, and this also can be useful. You're talking about representability with someone else, um, and you don't want to go through the whole stuff about uh, what they forgot to teach you about R. This is a much smaller chapter, much more uh, easier to, to get started with. Um, and this is gonna explain some of the bigger ideas of why version control, why organizing your code and stuff can be useful. So, uh, so a lot of these same ideas are like in a way explained by, um, by the, why they forgot to teach about our uh, set of slides, but, um, 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 but this, is a, this is a smaller version of all of that. So, um, um, one point here is um, Jeff has this point about how someone else run your analysis, run your code. And I think it would be interesting for us to have some type of code review sessions where like we don't actually run the code from someone else, but we look at the code someone else wrote. And then we can be like, oh, like um, uh, uh, you can point out things that were like, oh, I'm not sure I could understand this, you know, your code later on. Um, because of X or Y, maybe you need to have a comment, maybe, maybe, uh, um, maybe you have a lot of, you have a lot of, a very complicated code chunk that could be simplified by having some functions, right? And so, um, that type of thing I think could be useful for us to do, uh, and not necessarily me revising your code, but like among you, right? That could be, uh, useful, um, um. And uh, you should feel free to, to request uh, 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 people in the team to spend some time looking at your code, right? Because it's gonna, uh, first of all, like, I mean, right now with all the pandemic and stuff, right? It's gonna provide you an opportunity to chat with someone, right? 
to not feel so lonely. Uh, but then also to um, 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 uh, make sure that you, what you're doing will be understandable by other people in the future, right? Um, or maybe you want to bounce some ideas off, right? Because there's always many, there's always an infinite amount of, well, infinite. there's always a ton of different ways that we can solve a problem, right? And so uh, sometimes it might be good to, to explain what, you th what you're thinking of doing, the logic of what you're about to do to someone else. Um, so I think we could, we could uh, rely on this a bit more ourselves. Um, cool. Um, so at the very end, um, Jeff has his data analysis checklist. Um, so it's kind of like that career questionnaire, right? But this is for a data analysis. And so um, this is actually like in a way, a great way of question, uh, a great, um, uh, how do you say this in English? Um, uh, Like if you're studying for an exam, you might make a summary if, um, the day before the exam with all the main things. What is that called? Uh, like a cheat sheet? Yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, so this is like a cheat sheet for us that could be really helpful when we meet with other people uh, and then we can ask them like uh, uh, some of these questions, right? To get an idea like where they are, what are the next things they need to do? What are some of the things that they, miss doing that could be important for them to do. So there's about questions about answering, you know, having your question defined, then have they checked the data, have they tidied it, have they explored it, what type of statistics are they trying to do or they're doing prediction, um, uh, causality, like what are some of the issues uh, related to, to causal analysis. Uh, if they're talking about papers, then have you, you know, have you described the question, have you, uh, you know, use clear notation, like um, in specific details that can be useful. If you're uh, talking about a presentation, like uh, this could be useful for yourself, right? Like if you're making a presentation, have you led with a brief statement of the problem, etc. cetera. Um, so all this stuff is useful. Um, even for our packages, like have you made your package findable through Google uh, and stuff like that. So, um, uh, uh, so with that, let me stop recording. <laughs>